Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Journey to the Pit. I'm Jim Collins, and I'll be your host this evening. If this is the first time uh, watching Journey to the Pit, we are a game foul show that interview game foul breeders from all over the world of all different farm sizes. So tonight we have another special guest that's going to bring many, many, many years of experience to this interview in the hopes that it can help somebody out there. But before we get started, let me go ahead and say a disclaimer. All the information discussed in this interview is for historical, educational, and entertainment purposes only. None of this information is intended for any illegal purposes. All opinions are respective of the individual and all rights are reserved. So tonight, tonight, we have Mr. Ronald Mullins that uh, we are so glad to have on the show this evening. So we're going to get in a very deep conversation about his bloodlines, about his selection process, his bitty care, his raising, his calling, and some history and some stories as well. So guys, just sit back, grab you a, a cup of coffee or whatever your beverage, your favorite beverage is, and sit back and let's enjoy this conversation that we're going to have with Mr. Ronald Mullins this evening. So Mr. Mullins, welcome to the show. We are so glad to have you this evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me on. So, Mr. Mullins, uh, I know you have watched uh, previous uh, shows. So, uh, you know, before we get to kind of digging into this conversation, I would like for everybody that is watching as of now, if y'all guys can just put in a chat uh, where y'all guys are checking in at or where y'all guys are, are from, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. But, guys, uh, like I said, also, let's welcome Mr. Mullins for coming on and spending his time with us and sharing his story and his experience. So, Mr. Mullins, let's go ahead and get started. What I usually like to do is, is talk about maybe a little history, you know, how you got into game foul and, and uh, that to kind of get started so all the new viewers can have an idea of just a little bit of your backstory. Well, I guess we could say that I was kind of born into it. I've, uh, okay. My dad was a, was a one that, that had him and, uh, you know, uh, being with him for years and he taught me a lot and uh you know then i had um uh you know my grandfather on one side he was uh uh he showed chickens and then i got two or three uncles on each side of the family that showed chickens so just uh kind of been into them all my life and been around a lot of people that had chickens so hey, that's you know right. It would be strange not to hear one crow, you know. <laughs> so I guess you've been hearing them crow since you came out the wound at one 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 reason or another, huh? <laughs> yeah, just about it. You know, you gotta hear that rooster crow before you can get your day started. <laughs> no, that's right. So listen, I, I I'm assuming how long have you been in the sport? So maybe we can kind of talk about some old stories as well. Well, uh, you know, I, I as I said, I've been around them all my life and uh you know, of course, back when it was legal, I handled my first one when I was 13 and, you know, and kind of been in, kind of been in ever since then. Yeah, kind of went for it. So, so not, not the actual age, but uh, just saying at the age of 13, obviously it was legal at that time. Oh, um, yeah. It was definitely legal at that time. Uh, you said you handled your first one at the age of 13. Like, where, yeah. where were you? Uh, what place were you handling? Was it a small venue or something big or? It was, yeah, it was kind of big. Okay. Was it located, where was it located at? Was it a? It was lo located right in my hometown in, in town, Virginia. Okay. 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 So you handled kind of in your hometown. So you stayed in your own background, I guess, being so young. Yeah, well, I, of course, you know, my dad was there and everything, but, you know, he just, uh, he said where I had hipped him and took care of him and was all the time there, you know, he said that, uh, that, uh, cause I, I guess, you know, as a little kid, you, all the time I'm going to try something new, you keep asking, can I, can I, can I, can I, and he told me, he said, yeah, we go this time, you're going to do it. That's right. That's right. Can you remember, uh, what blood it was? Do you remember the rooster? What blood it was that 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 show that you had? It was a gray rooster. It was a gray. Yep. You remember what family? Hype Bumblefoot, Hype Hatch. 
Had don't before have had, Chan. Yes. Was it something y'all guys bred and raised or? Yes, we had, we bred and raised them, yes. Mm. So it, it was a great feeling. I'm assuming you out there showing something that your guys bred and raised, huh? Yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, I just, uh, uh, you know, of course, when it, when it was legal, anytime you go and, you, and uh, you know, and then you, you would win, it felt great. But they were just so much pride if you uh, had hatched that chicken out of an egg, raised him all his life, then taken and showed, you know, and had a win. It just uh, was so much pride, so much uh, kind of make you square your, square your chest out and say, look, you know, look what I done, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So tell me, so at the age of 13, um, Honestly, it really don't even matter how you've done, win, lose, or draw. I mean, that that's definitely a, a, a wonderful experience uh, to be be able to show something that you raised. Um, so would you say uh, that's when you kind of got the bug? Like, did that really do something to you that kind of pushed you to, okay, this is what I want to do since it was your first time? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I love being around them and then took care of them. And, you know, you're feeding and you're watering and all that stuff, but. It's just like when you handled and that just made you want to desire more, you know, gave you a, a better taste for the sport, I guess. Mm -hmm. Gave you more pleasure, mm -hmm. I can say, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Kind you, of know, see hard work at play. you know, because that guy, you know, you see, your, you see your dad going there and win and win, you're happy and everything. But when you do it, it's a little bit. What do you want to say? More pleasure or, or easier yeah. for you or. You know, it's just so, so, uh, so much because, you know, you put in so much work, you know, you're 90 degree days in the summer and you're, and you're 10 degree days in the winter and you're out there every day, you know, it's just something that pays that's, off for you. That's right. That's right. So tell me this, Mr. Mullins, what families, uh, two things, kind of twofold. What families did you start out with, say, when you was 13, 14, 15 years old? And then what families kind of did you shift to, you know, as you got older, where you would take, you know, old enough to take care of your own fowl? Because obviously 13, 14 years old, you still just taking care of what your father had. You know what I mean? Well, uh, basically, I would, uh, at 13 or 14, you uh, you kind of get sick at chores. He gets first choice and you get the next chores. <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh, uh, of course we've always had the uh the the gray blood and the uh and the hatch blood and uh that was basically our our two main bloods when I was with my dad and then a little bit later on we went to the the butchers and okay. uh, and I could say me that's that's the one blood that I got in and took off with was the was the butcher blood. Was the butcher's and, huh? yeah, and a lot of people, you know, and uh the butchers has been my bread and butter for years. Okay. Seems so like I can just I can depend on them. You can depend on them. So tell me this, what made you pick the but butchers uh when you you know, other than the hatches and the graves that you had, what what pushed you towards the butchers? Tell us that story. I, I, I just like the butchers. I, I like the way they looked. And mm -hmm. uh, the biggest thing is, is I seen the uh, guy that was showing and he was putting the W's up one after another. And and as many of you have talked before, I don't care if they're green, purple, yellow, everyone. If they put the W up there, that's what you want to go for when it's legal, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, the butchers was a, was a winning fight, a lot of fights. And uh, I just like the way they looked and you know they was uh nature good nature chickens and and you could work with them and and uh that was just I don't know it's just something that I like better than I did the others. Right. So is the butcher something that you kind of uh resonated to or is it something that your father did and you just agreed with it or is it something that you kind of went after? No, it's something that I went after. OK, it's something that you and that's what I wanted to kind of that's kind of how I want to get to the story, because now you starting on your own journey. 
you know, before as a, as, as a young teen and a young man, you kind of was under your father's wing. So you yeah. kind of, your journey kind of began it with these butchers. Yes. Uh, I got these butchers and of course these butchers, uh, the story about the butchers is that, uh, there's a man <clears throat> in our, um, area here where we lived mm-hmm. and, uh, he has passed on. His name was was Harry Lee Strauth. And, Harry uh, Lee Strauth? Strauth, S-T-R-O-U-T-H. Okay. He went to uh, Arizona to a show to buy some blue face chickens okay. in 1954, I believe it was. And um, when he got there, there was a man named Billy Apsher. Mm-hmm. That was showing butchers. And Harry chose to get the butchers rather than the blue face blood that he originally went for. And uh, they left Arizona when when the show was over and they drove to Oklahoma where Billy lived. Mm-hmm. And Harry Lee let him have the the butcher chickens that he brought back to Virginia. And um, Harry was in uh, partners with uh, Gary Mullins. Okay. And uh, then Harry more or less decided to uh, get out of it, and Gary got everything that they had. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we got the uh, we got the chickens. And, uh, of course, I guess it was, um, good that my sister had married somebody that was kin, kin to, uh, Gary. Oh, she did, huh? <laughs> yeah. So that's how, <laughs> I, that's how we ate, basically ended up with the blood. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then of course, I mean, me and Gary's friends and, and a matter of fact, I spoke to Gary today. He's uh okay. well up and he's well up in age. Right. And um he said that he bred these butchers for 38 years. 38. So he does he still have them today? Uh you no, know, Gary don't have nothing today. Okay. Okay. Uh <clears throat> and he said I believe they were just as good as when I let the last one go as with the first one that I got. Mm. and uh of course gary was good friends with uh you know red richardson and and uh you know pretty close to harold brown and all them too you know okay and uh the butcher blood that you see uh uh you see red richardson would have back in the day is uh is the blood that gary had Right. You know, and, and well, even the story goes in, and they are the Marsh Butchers. They're the Marsh Butchers? Yeah, because uh, uh, Billy Absher, the, the guy that got them, went through a friend who is, his name was Ledbetter, mm-hmm. and, he, and he went to school with Bill Marsh. Mm-hmm. And he got Mr. Ledbetter to go get him the butchers because uh, I reckon, he, from what I can understand, he could. Okay. But uh, this guy named Ledbetter had went to school and was friends with with Marsh, and he went and got the chickens and let Billy Billy have them, and that's how Harry ended up with these chickens. And then when Billy got them, he actually bred some. A little bit more butcher blood into them. A little bit more butcher blood. So ask me this, yeah. Mr. Mullins. So so basically with 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 Mr. Gary having him, uh, he said that they were just as good as the day he bought them was the day that he got rid of them. And and back then he was, you know, a uh, uh, very, very tough competition. He was competing in very, very tough competition. So that kind of spoke volumes of the quality of the butchers, huh? Considering the competition that Mr. Gary was competing against. Yeah, and for the people that's on here that knows about it, he was at uh, 
you know, Del Rio. Okay. And he would go fight the eight cocks, and and uh, most of the time he, he would take, uh, you know, butcher roosters, and of course, you know, you're gonna fight cross roosters here and there. When you know, back then, a lot of people just breed for pure stuff now. Right. But you know, he take pure butchers, and he take some hatch butchers, and he even he even had some gray butchers. But you know, Gary was about top of the line when he went. Right. Right. And tough. You know, and then he and then he told me the story about you know um. He said he won that, uh, it was an eight cock. He won eight straight with them butchers down there. And he said only six fight that, uh, uh, when he walked out of the pit, there stood Harold Brown and said, Gary, I'd like to have that rooster. And Gary said he made that gift, uh, rooster a gift to, to Harold Brown. Wow. Wow. And those are still the same butchers. That's the same line that you're breeding today. The same line I'm breeding today. The same line you breed in today. Hmm. And then, of course, you know, the, the guy that has helped me keep the, keep the butchers, mm -hmm. uh, his name is James Alt Mullins. And uh, he's had these butchers since 1970. 1970. Okay. 1970. And he still got them today. And uh, I would just about say that he is uh, probably known just about all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's known for is the butchers. Is the butchers. So so tell me this, Mr. Mullins, for, for the people that don't know. Uh, say back in the day when Gary had him and stuff back then when he was at Del Rio. What type of characteristics? Like why were these butchers so effective? What type of characteristics? And also what weapon were they showing in back then? The uh, the butchers always carry a pretty good station, okay, with them, and most of the time they are pretty well feathered out, about as good as any rooster could be. Mm -hmm. And back then it was just about all gas, okay. And uh, and there was the old saying, and we still say it sometimes today: you don't stand in front of a butcher because he's going to cut you. Mm. They say if you stop in front of a butcher, you're cut. Got you. They just so, they just cut extremely well, you know, and then and, and then if it got down to a hard fight, you know, they had it what it took them. They they could uh, you know go to the drag and, and slap it out with you if they had to. So so they known also to be good cutters, but they also known to be game. Yes, they're known to be game. I I asked Gary one time, I said, have you ever had one to uh run or quit on you? And he said, I he said, I'll be honest with you, in 38 years, he said, I had one or two that didn't pick back, but that I thought could pick back. Right. He said, but I, he said, but we don't know how bad they're cut up. And we don't know what's done to them. Mm -hmm. He said, but I've never, I've never had one to take off on me. Gotcha. So that's probably the reason why he continued to breed those things for 38 years, huh? Yeah, he continued, he continued to breed and, and, uh, you know, that was his, uh, blood and he told me that uh he said it was uh probably 15 to 20 years later he said harold brown called him and told him he said gary uh he said uh mr red richardson had given me uh some butchers he said i about lost them he said i need you to send me uh uh two bullets and a stag if you can mm -hmm. and Gary told him, he said, well, they're on their way. He said, I caught them up and, and sent him to him. And he said, that was the last ones that I let him have. And he said that Harold got sick shortly after that. Wow. So, wow. So, so I guess during that era, those butchers were extremely effective. Now, let, let's talk a little bit about, because obviously we know this is many years later. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's many years later now, but let's and, and what I want to do is I kind of want to talk a little bit about how they were built back then. Uh, more so going into the 90s. That was back in what the, the, the 70s and the 80s. Yes. Um, yeah. 70 and the 80s. And then I want to talk about in the 90s, because what I would like to see if there was any transitions, like as far as their structure, their station, their back sizes. Did, did you see is, is there a difference in the 
butchers that's being bred today versus the butchers uh, that would that Gary was breeding back then as far as confirmation, you know, body structure. Or do they I would say much not much. I, I would say not much at all. Most most butchers have good station, good mm -hmm. feathers, and they got a pretty good broad back on them. Okay, and uh, you know they uh, for some reason the uh, and I don't think I can uh, suggest with this would just be a strong bloodline is been able to keep them this long and and uh, you know have them as as good as they are you know and um, I give a lot of credit to James on Mullins I I mean I know there's a lot of them out there but in my opinion he is the best breeder mm -hmm. that I know of to keep two bloodlines that long and they're still both you know, we're producing when the life you know, when it was legal and everything is still going, you know, and it's right. he uh you know, he done it for, you know, years and he's had these chickens for years. Right. So do you can you tell us how a butcher was created? Do you know that? Um <clears throat> just by what uh somebody told me and I take the man for his for his word that uh mm -hmm. That the Marsh Butchers is made up of a white apple cock, mm -hmm. and he got a hen from uh, Ray Shelton, the Roundhead Man. Okay. And but the hen was a a, a Cuban hen. Say that one more time. Cuban. A Cuban. Yeah. That's what they told me. I, I'm just telling you. No, I, then, I, want you, I want you to, yeah, hey, I want you to alter the story. Tell, <laughs> <laughs> tell mm. <laughs> I don't want you to alter the story. You know how it is. There's no scripted in here. We all authentic. Okay, so that's, <laughs> and the only reason I say that, because I know uh, there's there's always been a lot of interest in crossing American uh, with Cuban, with Spanish, and other types of, you know, breeds so so that that's the only reason I, I say that so go ahead i'm sorry to interrupt but i had to you caught me off the bar with oh, that. no 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 that's fine and he uh shelton gave morris the the hen to breed to the white apple cock and uh she was cuban and had a little bit of uh the typewriter blue i think okay in her. and uh that was bred to the white apple cock. Okay. And they bred it, I think, a couple of years and then they set the family that way. They set the family. So so way that's the reason that's the reason you'll get a spangle out of butcher chickens because of the white apple cock. Wow. Cause I asked you that the other day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I asked you that. And you, you told me. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And 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 it's funny because there's a few uh people in the chat that knew that about that Cuban hen. I mean, I, that is a few people in the chat that knew that about that Cuban hen. So, hey, I guess that story stands correct because you're not the only one that's saying the same thing about that Cuban hen. Huh? Well, Mr. Gary Mullins told me that, so I I, I take it as, as, as the gospel. Is, yep, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I wouldn't see why you would doubt it anything. So tell me this, and I know you can't read nobody's minds and you wasn't there. What do you think made them use a Cuban hen? Well, uh, just uh, sometimes you just uh, have a urge or a fling or something to, to see if that if something would work. And I think that's what they, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, just trying to do something new and. You know, and he said that uh, from what Gary said, the uh, Ray Shelton had told him, "Hey, I uh, I have all brothers out of this hen, and they're pretty good chickens." Wow! You know, so he took the hen and bred it to his white apple cock, and that's where he came up with the uh, the butchers. And and I'm I'm glad, and you heard that story straight from Mister Gary, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm glad you sharing that story, and I didn't know that you snuck that in on me. But uh, <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, I'm glad that you said that, and and the reason why 
Um, because for the ones out there watching now and later, that shows you one of the best breeders of his times back in the day. You're still great all the way until he got out. Um, tried something new. You know, did something that if he would have asked five people, they probably would have told him, nah, you don't need to do that. No, nah, what you using crossing Cubans into American foul and all this? You know how it is. Yes. But yes. It, it shows you that these guys at the top of the food chain, they're all, always doing research and develop, you know, experiment. You can call experimentation because yes. everybody is trying to, you know, when you at a certain level, you can't just do what everybody else is doing. Because you're not going to get ahead. So you have to always be trying to figure out uh, something new. Now, I'm sure if that Cuban cross did not work, nobody would have never known he ever done it. Never know. But, never know. But exactly. But since that Cuban cross worked, now people know about it. But yeah. just, just think about this. He did not know that Cuban cross was going to work. Before he done it, he done the cross and then found out that it worked. He didn't know yeah. it was gonna work, right? Right or wrong? Would you agree? No, he didn't. Had no idea. Exactly. He had you no know, idea. It, it, it goes back to the, what I've heard: if if a man's got a closed mind, he can never learn anything, or he can never do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you got to be open and and uh, and uh, old chicken men have a. Uh, Got an old saying, you know, that a that a rooster will make a liar out of you every time, you mm -hmm. know, and that, and that, that's kind of true. And you know, if if, if it'd been me when he offered me the Cuban hen, I would probably said I don't want it. Yes, sir. <laughs> so that ain't gonna work. <laughs> and you know, it's so funny. Uh, it's a couple of people in the chat that's talking. What's up, Ronnie from Cali? Uh, Ronnie said the Cubans was used uh, because they hit the head back in the day with a lot of those older families. They use the Cubans. Um, uh, Donnie French said that, uh, yeah, you could ask 50 people and all of them would have told you no, uh, which is 100 percent, 100 percent correct. I'm going to put some of these comments on the screen, guys, uh, because in what I'm hoping. What I'm hoping the people that's watching and the people that will watch in the future that you don't need anybody's permission. They're your foul. It's your money. It's your time. You don't have to tell nobody what you're doing because a lot of times I think some of the greatest birds were never created because somebody talked a person out of, out of making a cross. You know what I mean? I truly believe that. And not only just in chickens, in many other disciplines, horse racing, dogs, cool oh, yeah. dogs, greyhounds, yeah. a lot of the greatest animals were never created because somebody talked them out of doing that cross so i'm hoping for the individuals that's watching now and later that you don't need permission keep your experiments to yourself do you think any of these restaurants and, and corporations and car manufacturers and technology companies they don't share what they're working on like you don't no. know about a new feature on a phone until the phone comes out you don't know about a new thing in a car until it goes to the you know the car show up there in detroit so they're always doing something in the background. And I'm hoping through this interview that I know y'all guys don't need permission, but it seems like some of y'all guys need permission. Don't do 10 experiments on your farm. You know what I'm saying? Don't don't have a whole farm of experiments, but have a few have one or two brood pins. Try something new. Don't even tell nobody what they are. So you don't have to worry about any feedback. Just try it and see what happened. Because look at that. That one man made that cross and created a bloodline that's still around 50 years later. Think about that. Yeah. One experimental cross created a family that is still around 50 years later from an experiment, right? Yes. So um, I'm hoping for the younger guys out there um, coming into the sport as a breeder, uh, you don't need permission. Um, try different types of things, uh, always experiment. And again, keep your experiment small, just like any other company, you know, Ford motor companies don't have a whole half a factor of experiments. You know what I mean? They got a yeah. lab over there. They got one little department and they always working on new things, new suspension, new, you know, all kinds of new things. The same thing you should do on your farm. 
as well. And I'm glad that Mr. Mullen shared that story because he just proved that an experiment was done and 50 years later is still producing quality foul. So um, I really appreciate you sharing that. I didn't even know you was going to share that, but that, that to me speaks volumes because there's a lot of uh, individuals out there that refuses to try any experiments if somebody tell them it's not going to work. So, but well, I, you it. know, I think the, the the best teacher, you know, of course, as I said, I I was with my dad, so you know, I mm -hmm. picked up a lot from him. But mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that I learned from chickens has has been trial and error. And mm -hmm. you do it in trial, and you say, "Well, I won't do that no more." Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes <laughs> it's 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 right. And you say, well, I got to keep doing that, you know, and right. that was just like a, a quick story. Um, I had a gray cock and he was in a pen and I had a butcher hen that would bring off dids. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she'd bring them off, she would not wean them. I mean, they were just about big enough to top her and she'd still be with them. What? And uh, she hatched them off at one year and... I called her up when they was about two months old, and I just throwed her in that pen with that gray cock to uh, um, make sure nothing didn't happen to her. Right. And uh, it wasn't too long. She went to uh, lay in. She hatched off. I think we hatched off something about like 16 or 17 kicks out of her. Ended up with, I think, nine or ten cocks. And... Uh, I'll be honest with you. I just throwed her in there to make her sure she was safe. Mm -hmm. That's some of the best roosters I've ever owned in my life. You got to be kidding me. And needless to say, after that, I, uh, you know, bred uh, chickens that way until I could no longer breed them that way, you know. Wow. So you threw a hen in there she just was, to make she sure she's. She was a spangled butcher hen. Mm -hmm. I throwed her in there with that gray cock, and the, the, the cock was pure. Mm -hmm. And the strange thing about it is every stag that come out of her was red. Every pullet was gray. What? Now, I know that's a little bit strange, but it sure was. And if you and you said that there were some of the best roosters you ever owned. Some of the best roosters I ever owned. Wow. Done by accident. Done by accident. Done by accident. Huh. And you tried to, you maintain that uh, until you couldn't maintain it anymore. Yes. Until I lost the cock. Until you lost the cock, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. Ain't that something? It's almost like yard monkeys. I seen a guy yeah. show with some yard monkeys, and they were phenomenal. I had to go to him and his son. I said, man, those birds are phenomenal. He's like, man, these are yard monkeys. He said, I got about 150 of them. They're all yard monkeys. I mean, phenomenal. Came back the next year with them same yard monkeys. Different ones, not those exact ones. Yeah. But different ones. And did horrible, like pure. It, they were pure trash. <laughs> They're straight, 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 pure tree. They were just straight trash. But uh, <laughs> the great thing about you, they they weren't yard monkeys. You knew exactly who the mother and father was. So that that separates yeah. your situation. Wow. So yes, when, okay. it, when, it, when it was legal and and them same chickens right there that. Uh, that I was talking about those roosters. And of course, you know, it was legal, mm -hmm. you know, I, I went to show with them and, and of course was lucky enough to win, but I met Mr. Pete will be and all them guys down there that day. What? Yes. Hmm. Huh. So you went to tough competition. Yes. With that, with that experiment, well, it, it wasn't even experimental. It was an accidental breeding. It wasn't even experimental. Just accidental, it was like yeah. Just accidental. Wow, ain't that something? Hmm. So, 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 tell me this, Mister Mullins, uh, with the butchers, because you didn't had them a long time. How long have you had the butchers? 
Uh, Just the '80s, it was, or I picked him up. Yeah, probably around around that time, sometime. Okay, so you had him since the '80s. Yeah. So tell me this: What were the characteristics like back then in the '80s and '90s? You know, what was the characteristics of these butchers? I know you said they cut. And they were game, but were they fast? Were they intelligent? Did they have good movement? You know, they did good timing. They, 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 they were they was intelligent, and uh, of course, you know, uh, all of them just about it at that time came uh, uniformed. Mm -hmm. You know, just about every one of them had uh, two or three white streamers in their tail, and, and you know, a few white feathers in their wings. Mm -hmm. But they they was excellent cutters. They was uh, nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. They 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 was there for the fight, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just so happened as old guy says, if you, if you want to break six foot in the air, they could do that with you, or they could fight on the ground with you. And don't so get the, one of them and miss because most likely they were going to key they when they get back. Mm. So they were all around, can fight in the air, fight on the ground. Yeah. You would say that they was pretty accurate as far as when they hit you, they was going they was going to cut you deep. Oh yeah. And and would you say they were intelligent or Yeah, they was intelligent. They mm -hmm. uh uh you know, they, they I never seen too many of mine and I've had a lot of roosters that uh I thought was good roosters and probably was good roosters, but they've been mm -hmm. a rooster that made them change their style of fighting. Mm -hmm. And when they changed their style of fighting, they ended up losing. Mm. Well, I've never met nobody. I've never met somebody with a butcher that that rooster made the butcher change his style. Mm. Hmm. He was after you. He, he was out there to get you. He was out there to get you, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. So, so intelligent, had speed, good movement. Um, it, would you say, too, especially with it being Gav, uh, was butchers known to have a lot of power or they were just speedy, effective cutters? Or did they cut because they were so, they had a lot of power? Would you say they it was had a power? Of, yeah, they had a lot of power. They could hit. Mm hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I've seen them fight, you know, iron and a half in the drag, mm. you know, and they, they, they was game and, uh, and, uh, most likely I, I always felt like, and of course, you know, you feel a little bit different about your chickens and everything, mm -hmm. but, you know, I always felt like if they sent me to the drag and I was even with him with the butcher. 90% of the time, I was coming out of the wind. <laughs> you said you was coming. So they were basically really durable, huh? Yeah, they could they could take it. And seems like when you got down there, they, they're, they um, you know, you got your, your blue face blood. And I mean, there's a lot of good blue face blood out there. And it's like, you go to drag one of them, it's, I'll hit you and you hit me. Mm -hmm. You know, with the butchers, not like that. I've seen them hit a rooster two or three times before they hit back. Hmm. And, and it just wasn't just wasn't a, a little lick. I mean, it was hard to lick. Right, right. So, 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 so I, I guess that's where that intelligence also coming at that they're not just gonna go one for one, two for two. You hit me, I'm gonna hit you as many times as I can get away with. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So now we got some backstory on these butchers. So you got your butchers. You had them since the 80s. Um, you know, we got some other topics we're going to talk about is, 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 you know, chicks and raisin and stags yeah. and color and all that. But let's now kind of get into uh, you have had them all these years. Let's talk a little bit about in detail about your selection process, which are cock and hen. Um, we'll start with the cock. But if you can kind of go in details of what you look for in a cock to kind of maintain the line that you have maintained over the last 30 years, well, actually 40 years. Well, I'm going to say uh, something that a lot of people may, may not believe or 
or might shock them or whatever you want to say. But our first thing is when we go to pick up one is, uh, of course, your first appearance is going to be uh, uh, a lot to do with it because you want them to have good station, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, a short uh, station rooster, you know, they, they just don't show good. They, they just can't. Uh, when it was legal, they just couldn't win in the major competition mm -hmm. because of, of you know the the other rooster was uh, had more station than they did and mm -hmm. could get to them quicker than they could get to them and so you know you you look for a station and then when you pick them up you count tail feathers okay and I like a broodcock to have eight tail feathers eight tail feathers. Eight tail feathers. And uh, my dad's always told me to breed a rooster with eight tail feathers. Mm -hmm. And then I had an old man at the pit to tell me to breed roosters with eight tail feathers, and I'd never done it. So I decided to do it, and I did it with the butchers. Mm -hmm. And it was Ness Brothers. The one had eight tail feathers, the other had seven. Mm -hmm. bred the sister hens and the rooster with eight tail feathers sold out a percentage winning of 78 percent wow and the rooster with seven tail feathers sold out a percentage of around 65 percent wow so did your father or the other old timer tell you uh why to breed a rooster with eight tail feathers or they just said just gave you that advice hey hey son uh breed something with eight tail feathers they just gave me that advice and mm -hmm. and, and you know as i said most of, a lot of the stuff i've learned has been been trial and error mm -hmm. you know and uh you know i tried that and then I then I even turn around and tried it with 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 my bumblefoots. Okay. And uh, the eight tail feather cock sold out about seventy four percent winners, and the seven sold out about sixty three percent winners. Wow! So you try with two I, different families. Yeah, and I've noticed that an eight rooster that's got eight tail feathers will throw more roosters that's got eight tail feathers than a rooster that's got seven tail feathers will. Okay, and I so I can't explain that, but I, I mean it's just it's just there. It's true. Yeah, we'll need you to. You ain't got to be scientific about it. We'll, we'll need you to explain it. That, that it is what it is. And again, if you try to explain it, you probably wouldn't. It probably wouldn't even be right anyway. It don't matter. So let me get this right. So the rooster with eight tail feathers pretty much throw more stags, or are you saying he throw more stags with eight tail feathers? He'll throw more stags with eight tail feathers. Okay. So that don't mean that he'll throw more stags overall. It just means no. the stags that he do produce will have eight tail feathers. Yes. Most and then the, the the cock with eight tail feathers throwed out more winners than the rooster seven. with seven tail feathers did. Got you. And uh, they was bred the sister hen, so I mean there was no difference in the process you know that's right that's right that's right huh you know and then and then in the, in the cock also i like for his wings to uh uh come back past his his, his butt and meet back there you know i like for him have long wings i like that too i don't like a rooster's wings that won't reach back there okay so you like wings that are pretty much touch at the tip behind yeah. his Touch yes. the tip. Okay, so you like a long, we like medium station, long wings, right? Yeah, I like long wings. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Tell me uh, that. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask about other parts of them. Go ahead. Oh, you, you know, of course, I look for the uh, uh, for the station of a rooster, mm -hmm. and I pick a rooster up. I like to. Uh, between his spur and the heel of his foot, I like for my thumb to fit between them. Mm -hmm. You know, 
So that, for one, seems like that's what I have learned is is the best cutting chickens that they are is those that's got that space. And so thumb I space tried, in between the spur and thumb, the top foot. space in between the spur and the top foot, yes. Gotcha. gotcha. You know, and if you, if you can't get it in, if I can't get it in there, I'm not going to use him. Because the spur is set too low. Yes. You know, and I don't know a lot about genes or chromosomes or anything like that, but, you know, I, I figure if that rooster has got that, that he could throw that more than I would like. Mm. So, you know, we do we do that. And then, of course, we get the tail feathers. And uh, we, we talk about pair like tail feathers, right? Because I've seen in comments when they say eight, you don't mean eight total. You just mean an eight on each side. Eight on each side. That's right. That's right. Now, and I ask you that because that was just clarification in the comment section. Guys were 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 asking. And also, too, uh, Tyler asks, uh, "Is eight counting a streamer?" No, eight is not counting a streamer. Okay, no. Tyler, uh, thanks for asking because that's a question that I did not ask. Okay, I assumed it was, and honestly, I did assume that it was. Okay, so eight is not counting a streamer. So we got eight pairs, eight on each side, plus the streamer, right? Yeah. So you got eight pairs plus a streamer. That's what. And he kind of, Mr. Mullins kind of went into the details. So if you haven't heard that, you can go back and, and listen again. Okay, so we got long, medium station, long wings that touch all the way behind the butt. We got that thumb distance between this spur and the top of the foot. Um, How about back? I like a I like a broad back, like a broad back, and I and and as as far as his eyes and I've not went into that a lot, but I mean if I got a red eyed rooster, I'd like to use him. Okay, so you you have a preference for the red eyes. Mm hmm. Okay. Hmm. How about head and size? I I like a <laughs> I like it to be as small as it can be because. Uh, a big head is just a bigger target. <laughs> <laughs> so the smaller that's the head, the better, the better we are, you know. <laughs> no, that's funny. You know? And one of the reasons I'm laughing, too, we had uh, uh, Jimmy Bratcher on here. And he talked about when he first started off with his fight, they had big old mailbox heads. They don't look, they don't have big mailbox heads now. He did an awesome <laughs> job heard them to what they were to what they are today uh they they phenomenal they look beautiful today uh but he said uh in his interview they started out with big old mailbox head big i think he called them meat heads big old heads <laughs> but, <laughs> big meat heads oh that is too funny so tell me no, this. i got i got a buddy that calls them logger heads <laughs> you know but but you know i don't like a big-headed rooster and and, and uh of course, you know the butcher is uh, has has a pretty good size head because they're straight combs and uh, and everything. But they're not big. You look, I look for the smallest as head as we can as we can find. You know, to uh, that stays within the uh, radius of everything else we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's what we uh, try to breed the hen. Uh, and of course, let me say this too. I like a cock that when you go out to feed, uh, he calls the hens to him. Okay. To, to come and eat. Because if they get down to eat or come to eat and he's a hitting or beating on them, I believe that puts the hen in distress. And mm -hmm. I just don't like that in a cock. Mm -hmm. If he's in distress, she can't be at her best. Mm -hmm. That's That's a so, great point. That's a great point. So you don't like no cocks. First of all, when you go out to feed, you like your cocks to call your hens to eat. And then yes. that gives you an opportunity to see how he deal with his hens. Like you said, if he beat yes. them up, it is to me, I, I think that's a fact. I don't see how it wouldn't cause distress because they're not designed to be beat on like that. You know what I mean? No. No. Mm -hmm. So attitude is definitely something that you also look for in a cock. Yeah, I look, I look you know, for the nature of him to... Uh... You know, more or less what I would call take care of his hands, you know. He would prefer them to come down and eat before he does anything, you know. Mm. 
you know, and I, and then of course I like a hen with a medium station and the small okay. hen. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I like a hen we... that's uh, uh, you know, got good feathers. Okay. You know, sometimes we even down a hen and count her tail feathers. Mm. And have uh, I have found some eight tail feathers in in some hens. Oh, you have. You know, but of course they don't have the streamer like the cock or nothing like right. that. You know, right? Uh, you know, and I like a hen that um got an attitude about her. You do, huh? You know, if you um, uh, just like you know, my son was talking about, he uh got uh or something like twelve pullets in a pen, and he. And uh, watches them every day, just like you know we did. Watch them every day to try to see a uh, difference in them. Mm -hmm. You know, and you want the one that's got the the attitude or, or the cocky attitude, the walk. In other words, that you would say, right? You know, wouldn't wouldn't be one of those that would be hunted up in a corner. That would not be one that you'd choose. Mm. You know, and then uh, you know, I like an end that. Uh, it's not a have to, but if I if I got a choice and and I got a hen with a spur and without, I'm gonna breed the one that's got the spur. Oh, so you like so you like a more dominant type hen or confident. I can, I guess we can say the confident yeah. dominant. Um, yeah. and, and then you like a spurred hen, huh? Yeah. I don't I, I don't know, it's just something that I that I like about them and and it's and you know it's uh I mean, I've had sister hens, you know, one had spur, one don't. And, you know, for some reason, I'd end up choosing the one that had spurs. Now, have you ever kept track of, like you did with the with the cocks, have you ever kept track of spurred versus non-spurred hens as far as what they produce? You ever did that? No, no, I have. I, I've never did that. Okay. You know, okay. that might be something I could do here in the, in the future, just raise them, see what they look like, you know. Right, right. See what they come out like. Hmm. So since you like the uh the confident dominant hens with spur, uh Theo asks, uh, how about hens that crow? I don't have no problem. They want to crow, let them crow. <laughs> <laughs> so Theo, uh, <laughs> Theo, that's your answer, brother. He said, if they want to crow, I, let them crow. I don't have no uh, I don't have no problem with it. I've had hens that crow, but a lot of time too, it's because they they've got mad or uh, you know been into a scuffle with another hen, you know, and th th then they would crow, and that 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 don't bother me. Okay. You know, I ain't never actually went out to breed a hen that crowed or anything like that, but you know, I know I've had several. Down through the years, a crow and crow and crow and stuff, you know, and it's, uh, I so never, never really paid no attention to it. Yeah, that's all I was about to say. So, nothing really ever stuck out that, 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 no. you, yeah, okay, okay, um, okay, but that, that's something. So, you said you like the ones because I know that a lot of times that's a hot topic, you know, guys always asking, you know, do you like uh, uh, hens with spurs or you like hens that crow? Uh, you said you really haven't seen any noticeable difference that will make you really pay attention to the ones that crow or spur. But you said you like spurred hens anyway. I like spurred hens anyway, and it seems like through my experience, the spurred hens are are the ones that's got a lot of attitude anyway. Mm. You know, so now that fall right then your that that fall right then your selection process. Them spurs, and so once you see that spurs, it kind of is the company by the attitude that you're looking for. Yes, you know, and I just like the, I got a buddy that, uh, that uh, got Claret Rooster from uh, Harl Brown back in the 50s or 60s, and they was Claret Roosters. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he got a Blacksburg one, which a lot of his did come Blacksburg because they was a real, real roosters, Mm -hmm. uh, a black spur one was a whole lot better than just the one that had a regular spur. What? Yes. If it was a black spur, he, 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 that was the one that he was going to take care of, and that's the one he was going to uh, take to the shows with him. Wow. 
And he said, Harold Brown told him you'll get the black spurred ones out of these and they'll be better than the regular ones that you get. And what family, what family was that? Clarets. Clarets, okay, Clarets. Hmm. Wow, okay. So now that we talked about the selection, what you look for in your hens, what you look for in your cocks, uh, let's talk a little bit about your breeding methods. You know, line breeding, inbreeding, brother, sister, father, daughter, mother, son. You know, let's talk a little bit about that. What's your concept or your methods that you use? I always try to, um, if I breed, breed a rooster and a hen, mm -hmm. uh, out of that setting, I like to at least have two stags that I can pick to keep the breed. Okay. And if you got a lot, you can pick three. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you do is you breed a rooster and a hen. Mm -hmm. And we'll just use, for instance, that you got two stags. Okay. And let's say you got four pullets out of the out of the nest. Okay. What you would do is uh, you would take the the sisters and breed them to their brother. Okay. And then the next year, you would take what pullets that you got out of the one setting mm -hmm. and put it over the other cock. Okay. And you now. would take what? Pull it out the other one back to the other cock. Got you. I understand that. I understand exactly what you're saying. Let's take this one step at a time so we can make sure that the 14 year old out there understand. So you got two okay. stacks. You got, you take a cock and a hen. You make that breeding. Okay. Yes. Out of that breeding, you got six total four pullets, two stags, correct? Yes. Okay. You take one of those stags. And breed him to all four hen, uh, pullets? No, breed him to two. Breed him to two. Okay. The other stag, do you breed him to the other two? To the other two. So you basically got two trios. Yes. Okay. So you got cock A and cock B, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. We got, we got pullets A, B, C, and D. Yes. So we are breeding cock A. To pull it A B. Mm -hmm. Cock bullets C and D, correct? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So we got two trios. Now, out of those two trios, let's talk about cock A and his two bullets. Out of that, out of that trio. What are we doing with the birds out of that trio? I am looking for the uh for the uh, best stag, mm -hmm. in my opinion, mm -hmm. and the uh, the best pullet. Okay. And I would be looking for the same thing out of the other set, other setting too. Okay. But but out of, out of their first settings is what I was getting ready to say is the the. Stags that come out of or, or the pullets that come out C and D mm -hmm. will be bred back to cock A. Gotcha. And it's the stags or the pullets that come out of A and B will be bred back to cock B. Gotcha. And guys, if y'all didn't catch that, y'all can just go back and watch it all over again. I completely understand exactly what he's saying. He got the two trios: cock A, cock B, pullet uh, A B. Uh, pull it CD and he's going to take stags out of cock a breeding cock a trio. Right. Yes. And he's going to take pullets out of cock B trio. Right. I'm taking pullets out of both breeds. Out of both. Okay. Okay. So you take them pullets out of both and you're going to cross the pullets to their uncles. That's what you're to basically their to their yes. uncles. Gotcha. I like to breed back to the uncles because I, I uh, to me, it, it's proven to be better than brother, sister. Uh, I mean, 
father and mother, mm -hmm. you know, breed the sister, uh, the daughter back to the father. Right. I mean, I, I've done it and sometimes you got to do stuff, you know, but mm -hmm. I had rather breed to the uncle. Then, or then the back to the father or, or then back to the father. Gotcha. Gotcha. So basically you're kind of creating two lines out the same blood. Yeah, but after you do that five years mm -hmm. or something, you can bring them back together and breed them together again. Got you. Hmm. You know, and of course, you know, this, this bloodline, the butcher bloodline has not been kept around without something, uh, as you say, want to be added to it. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is, is what has been added to it is the same blood. It's just like that. Uh, my friend James Ott, after about five or six years, I go to him and say, Look, I need a hen or I need a cock. Mm -hmm. But with my butchers, because mm -hmm. they're the same blood, you know, mm -hmm. and that will freshen mine up and and his also, you know. Right. Without without going away from without the infusing butcher. something totally different. Yeah, without putting another blood into them. Gotcha. Now, that's a good strategy. So you got, you, you, you take a cock and a hen, you breed them. If you can get four pullets, two stags out of that, you can pretty much divide them into two trios. You breed trio A, you B, breed trio B. You take pullets out of both of them, A and B, out of those breedings, and breed those crossways, meaning that breed them to their uncles. Huh. And then once you breed them to their uncles, right? Yeah. You take pullets out of that and then do the same thing again. Cross it over again. You can, yes. And I do. And you do. Right. You know, that's I continue to try to breed back to the uncles or the aunts, uh, you know, and uh I have been in situations where I I'd I've had to breed a pullet to her grandfather or something to try to uh, get the line, the bloodline where I want it. Right. You right. know, but I do not like breeding back to the father or breeding back to the mother. So, like, pretty much that directly. Okay, I got you. I got you. Mm. I mean, if you do it, it works for you. That's fine. I just, right. It just worked for me this this way better than it did the other way. Right. No, that, and that's what we want to hear. We want to hear how you doing it. Uh, okay. So, so, and that's pretty much the system you use to maintain these butchers, uh, since the eighties. Yes. Tell me this, but using that system, that breeding program, uh, is there any particular defects that you have seen like any any consistent defects that you have seen uh, throughout the years since the '80s from using that program, and and this is what I mean by that. A good friend of mine's very successful breeder. In his program, the program that he said he the program that he used, he said about twenty percent of the stuff that he produced come out too short for him, and he just calls them. So, is it any particular? characteristic that you see a negative not positive is there any negative characteristic that you see consistently from using that program i don't think it's hurt the station i don't think it's hurt the feathers i don't think it's hurt their ability okay but i do think it's made them a little bit uh meaner than what they usually are got you. you get a few that's a little bit mean got you Got you. Okay, and that's that's what I like because I like for I like to to make sure that guys understand. Uh, you know, we try to go as, in much detail as possible, but don't make everything just seem like a you know what I mean. Boom, we're gonna do this and everything's gonna work. There's there's two sides to everything, and that's why I like to hear too. Like, what is some of the stuff you see? So you have seen with that system, obviously have produced great results for you because you wouldn't have been doing it thirty plus years. Um, but you do see one consistent thing is sometimes uh, when you do when it do flare up is the meanness is the meanness. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's not ever one or anything like it. Just one here and there, 
but uh, let me say when they're mean, mm -hmm. most of the time you can call them a devil. Gotcha. Because it, it's pretty bad. It was pretty bad. So when it do pop out, it's extreme, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you open the door to one of them, you better be ready. <laughs> or he's going to teach you a valuable lesson real quick. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Okay, uh, that, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I want to hear because guys need to understand that. Um, and the reason why I say I'm, I, I wanted you to share that because I don't want somebody coming in a comment section out of a group and be like, oh, yeah, well, this happened, that happened. Listen, he didn't already told you. One of the things that he have seen, now it doesn't mean it's going to happen with somebody else's family. You're saying with your family, your butchers using that system, some of the things that have flared up over the last 30 years, is you will get a man fighter. Yeah. Okay. Not often, but but they do come along. But when they come, they come. I got you. Yeah. You know, and that's just like uh tell a little story. I I sold a man some uh matter of fact I sold him two or three trios mm -hmm. and and some of the chickens that I still own right now I sold him and he took them and he couldn't do no good with them. Mm -hmm. and uh, he talked to me and I said I don't know I'm bum puzzled I'll do whatever you want to do mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know he, and he was the first one that looked at me and he said you know what works for you might not work for me and what works for me might not work for you he said and I know that you didn't send me nothing that wasn't no good he said because I still see uh, mm -hmm. at that time showing it doing good with it and, 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 and everything Mm -hmm. And that's what he said. He and he said a lot of times it's not the uh, it's not the rooster. He said it's the man behind the rooster. Yep, that's the truth. And what he was saying, and and, and that's true. You know, some men can do better with different bloodlines than others can. That's right. I agree. So yeah. so tell me this, Mr. Mullins. Do you think <clears throat> one of the things that that could have created that is the fact that you know those butchers like inside and out obviously your customer don't know the butchers like you know them do you think uh that also could have been it just the fact that he didn't know them as well as you knew them yeah and another thing and as you said you know for, for everybody to understand is uh just like if i go to mr james ott mm -hmm. and now i'm 60 years old now you know if he tells me to breed this rooster to this hen, when I get back home, that's what that's what's getting bred, that rooster to that hen, mm -hmm. because it's worked for him for 50 or 60 years, you know. Mm -hmm. And and one thing, I told the man to breed this hen to that rooster, and he kind of crossed it up a little bit. He said he liked the other hen better, so he bred her, so that, that was totally up to him, you know. His way. But if, if a man has been successful for you know, years and years, and he tells me to do something, and he's being honest with me, I'm going to try to do it his way. I can always do it my way. Mm -hmm. You know, but if I he tells me, and he's telling me for my own good, why not try it his way? That's right. Because he's done it. He's made it, you know, and and uh, I just don't understand some people, you know, that uh, uh, you know, Want to buy, buy, and want to. They just, people just want to buy, buy, and buy, and uh, mm -hmm. and there's so much more pride and so much more happiness in chickens when you can breed them, hatch them, raise them up, and them show to their probability. Right. And and just to continue on what you said, and 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 I'll give you my input as far as doing what the breeder told you to do breed them how the breeder told you to breed them i say th th the best explanation of that is this there's a reason you went to that breeder and it's because you like what he's producing yeah. so you go to that you go into that breeder because you like what he's producing if the mm -hmm. breeder is telling you how to breed them why wouldn't you breed them that way he's telling you how to replicate what you came to his house or to his farm to buy right yes so 
when I go to a farm and, and, and guys are like, dude, with the amount of money you spend, you know, you telling me you don't go there and select on your own. How you know they're going to select the right thing for you? This is my thing. If you're going to his house to make any kind of purchase, you have to already have a level of trust. So I don't understand why you feel as though if you go into this man's house because you like what he's producing, but you think you can pick something better out of somebody else's creation. The man created those birds, but you think you can go to his house and, and select better than he can on birds that he created. Yeah, I don't understand that either. I don't understand it. So my thing is this, regardless of how much money you're spending, I go to a breeder. I let him select. Like last time I went to this, this breeder, I let him select a pair. What he did do is he asked me what I'm looking for. He didn't blindly select a pair. But he asked me, what characteristics are you looking for? I told him the characteristics that I'm looking for. And he made the selection for me based on what I told him. So if you're not comfortable with him doing a total blind selection or. You, I think it's better for you to give him feedback, say, hey, listen, I like what you're producing. I like I'm, these are the kind of characteristics that I'm looking for. I would like you to select a trio or a pair that you feel as though have a history of producing those characteristics. And that's how I, I that's how I told the breeder. That's exactly how I told him. And he said, okay. You know, you know another thing about game fowl is, uh, our brood fowl mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, me and my, me and my boy has discussed it a few times and, uh, he, he, you know, he's been in it for a long time too, but, I've been in it for a whole lot longer than he has, and sometimes I think he's smarter than me. Mm -hmm. You know, just like uh, not too long ago, went to put the boot fowl together and had one rooster running around acting crazy. I don't like to breed crazy roosters or crazy hens because mm -hmm. they produce crazy chickens. <laughs> I'm, I'm confident of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to... Uh, you know, get into a pen and then, then they just go absolutely nuts. Right. Or you walk up to the pen and they go nuts. You know, I don't, right. I, I don't like that. Right. You know, and, and, uh, he, uh, that's what he told me just the other day, well, a couple months back when we was putting everything together, he said, uh, I ain't breeding that hen. She's crazy. Right. Exactly. So, so that's one of the things you also look for too. You don't want them all yeah. flighty, flying around, and all that kind of out of control. No, I, I mean, I, I just, uh, I just think that, uh, from my experience, I, uh, crazy chickens will continue to produce crazy chickens. Right. You know, exactly. and then when you, and and you know, one of the first things I left out when you go to bird, to choose your brood fowl is they got to the first thing is they got to be healthy. Mm hmm. You know, if, if they ain't healthy, you can you don't need to be breeding them because they're not going to throw healthy chickens. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if uh, I don't care if you hatch a chicken out of an egg and and give it the best cure that you can give it, mm -hmm. if the cock and the hen was not healthy, that rooster will never be able to perform to one hundred percent because he'll never be totally healthy mm. because it, because the root his mom and dad was not healthy right so you right right so you can basically you know you if you get a a a, a, a stag or pullet out of an un, unhealthy cock and hen you can doctor them up you know you can get them uh 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 pretty healthy but basically what you're saying is they would never reach their full potential as if they came out of a healthy cock and a healthy hen. Exactly. Gotcha. So what he's saying is, Mr. Mullins is not saying that they'll never be healthy. He's not saying they won't perform. He's saying that, based on his experience, when chickens are hatched out of unhealthy parents, they never uh, reaches their potential that if their parents was healthy. And that, and I guess that applies in nature as well. Well, actually, in nature, unhealthy don't even get a chance to breed. 
Hmm. Yeah. So so that's basically what you're saying. And and I just want I just wanted to repeat that. So that guys don't get it confused and say, oh, my chicken is, is healthy. It came out of a, uh, you know, the cock and hen wasn't that healthy, but it looks pretty healthy to me. Well, he's basically saying that if that cock and hen that he came out of was healthy at the time, he would be better than what he is right now in front of you. Right. Absolutely. absolutely. That's what he's absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Because, you know, he would he would start healthy. Exactly. You know? Exactly. You know, and. and, so. and and Theo, uh, I just answered that question for you. That that I just explained it in another terms exactly what Mr. Muller was saying. No, he 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 can be healthy. He's not saying he can't be healthy. He's just saying that he will never be the bird that he would have been if his parents were healthy. So that's what you have learned throughout your experience. Sick chickens do not produce quality like uh, healthy chickens. Correct. Correct, you know, and I, I've uh, I've talked to people, and I've had people ask me, you know, what's what's the most important thing with chickens? Mm -hmm. I say absolutely, the number one thing is health. Mm. They got to be healthy. Mm. That's the reason that, uh, as I said earlier, when it's uh, ten degrees or zero, you're out there busting ice out of water cups, or when it's ninety degrees, you're sweating out there. Uh, make sure they got water and feed and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why me and my boy talks about everything. Going that extra mile so that rooster can go that extra mile for you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't give him the best care, he can't go that extra mile. Mm -hmm. And the best care is all year long. And, and you're Three. basically saying even before the age because his parents have to be healthy. Yes. You know, exactly. I mean, I did Health just means so much, you know. Tell me this, Mr. Mullins. You, you, you grew up in an era and, and you befriended some of the greats from the greats back in the day. Uh, where was health on their list of priorities? I think that, you know, uh, health was their number one priority all along, you know. Mm-hmm. I've been with uh, uh, Mr. Dale Cantrell. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, he, I'm a, I, I would be his cousin. Uh, I've seen him have a, 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 a thousand to fifteen hundred on string and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the time he got up to the time he laid down at night, he was making sure that they were taken care of and fed and watered and medicine was given to him and all the stuff even with him with that many mm -hmm. you know and he would say for a lot in top shape I don't want mm. you know and then he would raise that many and, and have them out there and, and uh, uh, you know I, for me I'll be honest with you I'm too lazy I don't want 1500 <laughs> yeah uh, that that's yeah. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of uh, me personally. I, I wouldn't ever want a big farm. I have been in plenty of them. I have stayed at plenty of them. So I have seen from sun up to sundown the amount of work that it takes uh, to um, run those farms. And it's a lot of work and it doesn't every farm doesn't have a team. Uh, I know farms that have just two people and have three thousand and have only two people, husband and wife. Um, I know farms that have close to 5,000 and have three people, husband, wife, and son. You know, this is what I know for a fact. So when guys are like, oh, yeah, the only reason, yeah. you know, they can raise them is because they got a whole team. No, that's not true. And uh, and like I said, I, I didn't stay at these places for more than one day, not just visit them. I have stayed there up to five days, and I've seen the amount of work uh, and, and what two people can do. Two people can take care of 3,000 chickens. That's a fact. Um, but it's well, you know, I, can, I, I consider myself a small farm and mm -hmm. and uh, used to carry about 300 cocks at all times, okay. Um, but now it's uh, you know, 60 or 70. But when we had the 300, you know, it, it was uh, 
to make sure they all got what they wanted. It, it, it was a big job with 300, so I can only imagine what it would be like with 1,500 or something. Right, exactly. It's too much. You know. Work. Yeah. Too much. So, work. you know, and then, uh, you know, I don't don't give him enough praise, but my son does the majority of everything at, at our place now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he, uh, he finally convinced me I'm too old. I'm too slow. So <laughs> I just, I just let him do most of it, you know? <laughs> I, that's right. So let's talk now. Let's kind of move in a little bit uh, uh, about the, you know, Biddy Care and your system with the Biddy Care and stuff like that. You know, we talked about the selection process. We talked about your breeding program. Um, do you hen hatch or, or, or incubate? I do both. Oh, you do both? Okay. I do both. And uh, a lot of times if um, – if I know the exact day that the hen went setting, a lot of times we will try to set a, uh, eggs at that same time so we can put a lot of those uh, chicks with her when she hatches off. Okay. Um, I mean, I do great with uh, incubated chicks and uh, a big percentage. And majority of them is uh, healthy, no crooked okay. toes. And, Stuff like that, but I still think a hen, it, it's just nature they do a better job. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 sometimes when uh, you got no hens to set and when you got all kinds of eggs. Mm -hmm. So you know that's the reason we use we use the incubator and when we we hatch off chicks, uh, the first three days of their life. Uh, we give them pre mocks on their water. Okay. And then we let them go a couple, two or three days with just plain feed and water. Mm -hmm. And then it used to be corried, but we went to the new stuff, or my son did. Mm -hmm. And I can't even say the name of it. <laughs> Is this uh, some stuff that Rick has, uh, has talked about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I can spell it for you. It's uh, I think it's T O L T R A Z U R I L or something like that. <laughs> Terizer, Terizer too. Yeah, like it is. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we use that for seven days. Okay. And uh, then we uh, just go back. You know, the regular feed and regular water, and uh, you know, uh, during this time, I feed them. Uh, uh, Crumble laying pellets is what I feed them. Oh, you do? Okay. Medicated or no? Uh, no medicated, no. Okay. Okay. Just regular crumble, crumble, 18% if I can get it. Okay. And uh, once they have uh, reached about a week old, uh, they begin as many eggs as I can gather up off the farm that's not being used for breeding purposes. I boil. And okay. chop them up and feed them okay. to the little ones. Do you include because, the shell or no shell? No, no shell, no shell. All right. Just, just, just the the white and the yellow, the boiled egg, okay. and them little varmints. They love it. Okay. They eat it like crazy. And then once a week, they get soaked dog food. Soaked dog soak food, huh? Yeah. Because if we need something, you know, like uh, we can put red cell in it. Okay. Or any vitamins in it that we want, you know, and then, you know, they'll eat that. They'll eat that soaked dog food like crazy, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we use uh, the, uh, you know, the, the apple cider vinegar just uh, every little bit to, uh, Try to help them out because I believe it does help a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, then once they're around a month old, we start them on the the regular uh, diet. Not diet; they still get the you know the, their feed, the same feed, okay. but they go on the same rotation as the uh, 
as the big roosters. The big roosters is red cell every Monday. Okay. You know, and, and vitamins every Thursday. Okay. Especially during the moat. Especially during the moat? Yeah. And when it comes to worming, you know, we, we I worm the little ones every time that the adults get wormed on, on, with, with the same thing. And and I use uh, uh, the Safeguard Goat Warmer. Mm -hmm. I put it in their water. Right. And then, of course, I use the Valbazin. I even put it in their water. Okay. And, uh, you know, of course, if I need to, I always have, you know, worm pills on, <clears throat> on hand. In case you need them, you know, and, uh, but they get wormed every 30 days and, um, in their water, okay. uh, you know, and every couple months try to make sure that they, uh, get deloused and everything right. to, to stay, to stay healthy. Right. You know, and I said, that's when the work comes in, when you got to get every one of them out and handle every one of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we, uh, I think it's very important if you can, and a lot of people can't, I understand that, is that you feed in water about the same time every day. Okay. To get their systems used to that time and get them in a routine where they can throw their feed and, and be used to everything. Right. And uh, I think a rooster needs, not should be, but needs to be hungry every time you go feed him. Okay. He needs to be climbing that wall wanting you to feed him. Mm -hmm. If he's just standing there, you're feeding him too much. You probably got a fat rooster on your hands. Gotcha. So you say when you go out there to feed, he needs to be climbing up that cage. He Look needs to be climbing that cage. Want me to come and give him something. Hmm. You know, and so uh, when you see pictures that guys got all this freeze spread all over the bottom of the pen and a rooster and hen is just walking around, uh, do that make you think that they feeding them too much? No, nah, feeding, feeding, them, feeding them way too much. I hardly ever will see feed laying in any of them, our fins, mm. you know, that's even the brute fins. You know, most of the time we go out there and I, and I don't care to tell people what I feed. I feed a Vianney cup full of what I feed every day. Okay. okay. And uh, I'll be honest with you, you, just watch your roosters. If you walk by and he's left some feed, well, cut him down to three quarters of a cup the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, but most of the time our roosters clean it all up and they're ready to be fed the next day. Right. But I think it, it's, I think it, I think it is important to have a routine to where they know what to expect, mm -hmm. and then uh, they know you're coming, right. and then when they see you coming, they know what you're coming for. You know, that's exactly right. So, so tell me this: what is some of the downsides besides being? Uh oh, popped out. You popped out for a second there, huh? Uh, yeah, you did too. I did. Okay. So tell us like what's some of the downsides uh, of, of overfeeding. We know it can make them fat, but if you're walking out there, you see all this extra feed spread all over the ground. You know, it's the weather's change is rain and all that. Like what is the downsides also of having all that extra feed just laid out all, all over the ground out there? Well, I think if they, if it lays out there and they do eat it, a lot of times they could be sickness. Or it could, uh, they can be crop bound. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, pellets definitely can't take rain, you know, and then, uh, right. uh, you know, a rooster is just, uh, that is fat. Mm -hmm. Goes back to, he, he's not healthy, mm. you know, and if a rooster is too fat, he can't, you can't even use him for a broodcock because he can't furl the eggs. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that that's and and so tell me this now that we're talking about this and like you said about the weight on them and stuff. So what do you think? Because every breeding season, at the beginning of every breeding season, you see guys on social media 
my hands are not laying, what I can do to get my hands to lay. Do you think sometime, but what is your thoughts on that? I'm not even going to put anything out there, but what is your thoughts on that? Uh, well, all I can say is, 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 uh, I, I've, I've had hands that, that wouldn't, wouldn't lay for me, you know, and, uh, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think her being fat would stop her from laying, but I mean, I, I most of the time our hands are, are, I mean, I had hands laid as early as, uh, January this year, and I mean, it was, uh, got down to below zero here, and they still laid. Mm. You know, I, I think if they're healthy, they got a cycle, they will lay when that cycle comes around. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just like uh, the breeding season, um, and it's talking about health, and, you know, I want my cocks at top of the line. Mm -hmm. I have seen years that me and my son has took brood cocks, and put them through a two or three weeks cheap before we started breeding them so they would feel great when we put them with those hens. Hmm. Hmm. That's good. That that that's the first I'd have heard that one. And it, it but it makes a lot of sense. So so you can literally it it because the goal is is the better the shape they're in, the more productive they can be. The testosterone yeah. would definitely be higher. So it mm -hmm. should increase their fertility, their ability to fertilize. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. That makes yes, a lot I of think, sense. I think it helps when you put them through that keep because it gets them to, to be at the top of their shape, you know, and they're in better shape than they have been, you know, all year at that time. So right. And, you and know, I'm a deaf yeah, that that's I, I agree. Um I also agree to not just being healthy. But I think brood cocks should all should stay in shape pretty much all year. You oh, know, I'm yeah. not saying you condition them all throughout the year, but I think your brood cocks, at least your brood cocks, should stay in good shape all year long. Not just healthy, but they should be in good shape. They should never be fat. They should never be too skinny. You know, they should be healthy, not just healthy, but in shape all in year shape. long. Yeah. yeah. You know, so big, you know, it's just like if you well, I ain't a good example, but, you know, if a man trains, you know, for a while, he's going to be in better shape and he would mm -hmm. be, you're better equipped to do anything that he was asked to do. That's right. That's exactly right. Right. You know, so that's the mm -hmm. same way with the roosters, you know, if he, if he's uh, in top shape, you know, and, and been through the, through everything, you know, he's, he's ready to go. Right. Right. I, and I believe, and, and the reason why I say that, because I have learned it through experience. I have learned that through experience with dogs and with chickens that uh, you need to your breeding material. You need to keep your breeding material not only healthy, but in shape all year long, all year long. You'll have a higher production rate. Everything could be better. They can breed more. They can deal with more hens. They could just do more of everything when they're in shape. So that's kind of what you guys are saying. Y'all y'all pretty much put y'all brood cocks through a keep. So when you put them yeah. in them brood, they're in tip top shape. Yes. You know, and, and for the hens, the thing about it is, is we don't change our feet a lot. I've heard some people say, I don't give nothing but straight laying pellets. I mean, that that's fine if that's what they want to do. But all I do is just turn around and add laying pellets to my regular feet. Okay. So that's basically what you do with your hen. Now, so do you feed the whole yard that or are you feeding that? Uh, no, just, uh, just the brute stuff. Just the brood stuff. Okay, so so tell us a little bit about your feed then, so we have an idea. Uh, Is it a pre-mix? Yeah, it's pre-mix. It's 18%. Okay. You know, of course, it's got the, you know, the whole corn, the sunflower seeds. It's got, I think, four or five different pellets in it, and okay. it's got uh, some oats in it. And, okay. uh, you know, it's, it, it's just a basic uh, mixture, you know. Right. Right. But it, but it's eighteen percent, and that's what we feed all year round. Eighteen percent, all year round, eighteen percent. And then during uh, a breeding season, you add a little bit more laying pellets uh, to your brood stock uh, feed. To, 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 to the brood stock, yes. 
Right. You don't you don't you don't feed that to the whole entire yard. Okay. No, just 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 to the brute stock and uh try as much as we can to get vegetables and fruit from the store to mm -hmm. get to the brute stock because you know they're them hens are laying and I think they lay better if they're uh have more stuff. Right. You know, and if you and if anybody will notice, a hen will drink more when she's laying than any other time. That's right. She needs that. She needs that moisture. She needs that water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we try to give them a little bit of mixture of everything. And you know, uh, during the summer months, we uh, we soak oats and feed uh, most time impossible about once a week. You feed what once a week? Soaked oats. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were saying you feed once a week. I was like, huh? what no, you say? Oh, <laughs> oh no, 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 no. They get fed every day. We feed soaked oats, and I and I'm talking a lot. A lot of people say, "Well, how much do you soak them?" Well, I've, I've had them to sprout on me before I feed them. <laughs> okay, so and, you and leave them out, I, and, I, and I still feed them because their roosters love them. Mm. So you never had to sprout them. When they're sprouted, yeah. Got you. So tell me you this. Know, I, I hmm. found out that an oak will, will help build a rooster's breast you know, about as good as anything. Mm hmm And that's mm -hmm. what me and Mr. Don Lester disagree on. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Don Lester, he don't agree with that, huh? No, he don't like the breast, and I do. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's funny because Don is all, <laughs> sometimes he's all over the place. Sometimes it depends on what what you talk about that day. He got reasons <laughs> though. I, I could I could say that though. He definitely got he got an explanation for everything that he's saying. That's one thing I can say. He's just not talking. He got explanations. Right. Sometimes you got to remind him, right? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, me and Don's great friends. Yeah, Don's a good guy. So tell me this, Mister Mullins. Since we talked about, like you said, about water, the hens uh, drink more when they're laying. What has been your experience? Because we hear a lot of talk about, you know, when it's cold, roosters don't drink. What has been your experience as far as uh, roosters drinking water in this cold out? Uh, yeah, I've heard that too. And mm -hmm. uh, some people may disagree with me, but I'm like, I'm like my buddy. You can be wrong if you want to be wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm right. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, I went out and watered and uh, got down one row mm -hmm. of water. And before I got back to my first rooster in that row, it was starting to freeze again. Right. But I seen roosters, as I poured water in their cup, take them a drink or two. Mm. So a rooster does drink during cold weather. And then if it's a dry cold, I've seen them drink a lot of water. Mm. You know, and then uh, that's what I said, you know, the, the extra mile when it's when it's zero and you got to bust ice out to water your chickens and, and uh, you know, then you're out there in that 90 degree weather. You're going that extra mile so that rooster can go that extra mile for you. That's because right. if you don't go that extra mile, he can't. That's right. And, you know, and I he and, it, and I wish you didn't have to water it in the winter time when I was doing most of it because, you know, I, who wants to be out there when it's zero? Right. You but know, I think it's important that you said that because I think a lot of guys think they can get away without watering during the winter time. I'm telling you, it's a lot of guys out there that think that watering is not that important in the winter because when they pour the water in a cup, the rooster didn't run right over there and drink it. So they they uh, get in the habit of ah they good I'll give them water you know I'll bust the cups every two days you know every other day I'll bust the cup and give them water. Basically, what you're saying is if it's a dry cold they'll think they'll drink a lot of water, but if it's a regular cold they still will drink water. So they basically need water every day regardless of if it's hot or cold. Every day they need water, mm -hmm. and you don't think a rooster needs water? Let him go a couple days without. If it snows, he'll eat the snow. Mm hmm. To try to get water. Mm -hmm. So guys, just to note to self, don't think because it's freezing cold outside that the rooster don't need water. 
The rooster still needs water. I'm telling you, you will be surprised the amount of individuals out there that feel as though they don't have to really water every day if it's cold. And they were like, well, I never did it, and, and it works out fine with me. It goes back to, like you say, if it works for you, I guess keep on doing it. But um, Well, I, I'll just say this. If you take the shortcuts, you're behind the man that didn't take no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. He's That's already a good, got a head start. He's already got a head start on you. That's a good point. So you heard it from Mr. Mullins. If you're taking a shortcut, you're behind the man who ain't taking shortcuts, right? Yes. That's what it is. So, okay. So we talked about the feed and stuff like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about things that you look for that determines your culling process. Like what type of stuff that you look for will determine if, you, if something is cold or not? Well, first and most of all, when they're smaller, if they hump up, mm -hmm. you know, they uh, are uh, not ones that I'm going to keep. Right. You know, and then if, uh, if as they begin to grow and develop, if, if they're stags, you know, if they're um, like hold their wings up on their back or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's not one I'm going to keep. You know, and if they got uh, um, you know, a crooked toe is is uh, I've heard a lot of people make different arguments about it, but I don't like it. Right. You know, and I'd probably do do away with it. Okay. You know, and if one is uh, uh when they get to be you know several months old if uh no one is not up to par like the other ones are mm -hmm. they're done away with and then when they get pen at age mm -hmm. you know if they don't have the right station or uh if they get right feathers you know and, uh, and everything they are kind of done away with got you and uh you know the pullets i look for you know the uh, good wings, the good uh, good tail feathers, small mm -hmm. heads, mm -hmm. and uh, things like that in, in, in the porch. Okay. Tell me this. What is your, what is your thoughts on uh, as far as birds getting sick? You know, do – because, you know, you hear so many guys, I don't run a hospital around here. Anything gets sick, I, you know, I call them. And like I say, it's for each his own because their chicken, their time, their money. What What is your thoughts on that as far as is there any particular sicknesses that you automatically call? Uh, do you try to treat one time and, 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 and then call? Or what is your position on that? Uh, well, where we're, uh, you know, we uh, run uh, every year. Was bait rolling when my son is switched to the newer stuff there. Right. You no, know, we run we run rolls through them twice a year. Okay. You know, about every six months, mm -hmm. which should take care of most of the sickness. You know. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to call, we call. We don't give them that. Uh, if you want to call it second chance, you know. Okay. Because okay. we done got that done got that medicine in them twice, you know, and then. Right. That should be that, good to go. That should be good to go, you know. Do you find um, in your program, do you find uh, yourself dealing with, you know, uh, sick birds? Like, do you, you know, is that something you, you, you typically have to you encounter or is it something you very rarely see? Barely rarely see. Mm. You know, just... Um, just, just don't see it, you know. Right. Now, then, then, you know, the lock on wood or what you want to say, but we don't encounter a lot of sickness. Got you. You hmm. know, so we try to uh, stay healthy. We try to stay healthy and try to stay. I don't want to give them too much to uh, what we call pre treat them, but I think you got to give them enough to make sure that something don't hit them. And they like, don't have nothing in their system. Like a preventative. Yeah. Exactly. 
So tell so, me this. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, like as far as the importance, like the condition of the yards. You know, I talked about this the other day. I knew you may. I think you did see because you was on there. But I talked about, you know, the condition of the yards, you know, how important it is to kind of stay tidy as best as possible on the condition of the yards. Do do you think that plays a role, you know, as far as trying to keep the yard as tidy as possible? Uh, what p played a role in it? The thickness? Yeah, like yeah, like if if, if you're trying to keep you're trying to keep your yard as organized and as clean as possible, do you think that also plays a role with minimizing the sickness and foul? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I don't know what you could be throwing down to make a a chicken sick. <laughs> you know, um, if if so, from what I was told, you didn't want to go to Judge Lacey's place because I had a man tell me that his uncle went there and his uncle said, if I didn't know the man, I wouldn't have bought no chickens. He said, because that was one of the trashiest places I've ever seen to be a, to be a chicken farm, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but no, I think, I, I mean, you should try to keep it picked up and, you know, it's just like the process now at, at my place. It's, it's mud where it's rained so much. That's right. You know, I, I'd be more worried about the mud than I would a, a jug laying over there or something. You gotcha. know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, and then during the when you can, you kind of got to try to treat the ground and as often as you can. Right. You know, because, you know, I mean, dirt. Anything like that don't bother me, but mud does. It, it, mm. I don't something I don't think a rooster can stay in and be healthy. Right. That's why I was going. That's my next question. I was going to ask you how you think that mud affects the chickens. You know, we uh, we uh, if it's muddy, we'll try to move them somewhere and and uh, and feed them, and you know, try to keep them out of the mud and as, as much as possible, and right. Uh, you know, because it, it, it's, it's just something that's a, uh, I mean, it don't only, not only affect their inside of the body, get kills the outside of their body. They got blood on their leg, you know, in their feathers. And, right. You know, so, I mean, they got to be taken care of. Right. That, that, yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. And I, and I think looking at the comment section, <laughs> everybody agrees. We all hate mud. To me, it makes things more difficult i don't care if it's the mud in the, in the winter or mud in the summer mud to me increases the chances of the birds getting sick uh, yes it does car, if you feed them on the ground it's very difficult if you feed them on the ground uh it's just a whole situation i see more birds getting the greens when it's muddy you know um so yeah it's it's uh, a lot more maintenance if you had a place uh that does get mud yeah, I had a guy tell me, well, walk somewhere different. Well, you can't walk somewhere different. That's the path that you take every day to feed your chickens. You can't go on the other side. Right. You know? I mean, as I said, some people don't don't understand chickens. And, right. You know, and, and a lot of people don't understand the hard work that goes into uh, having these chickens in, in good health and and uh, be able to perform to their top ability, and, mm -hmm. and that I, I think that's the difference in a lot of a lot of things this day and time. And is the guys, or when it was legalized, the guys that was on top had their birds performing to their top ability, and the mm -hmm. other ones didn't, and that right. made the difference in the end. Right, that made the difference in the end. You so know, now that, like, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, go ahead and finish because I got a question to ask you. I was I was just gonna say that um you know we was at a we was at a place and uh of course I was I was doing the handling and everything and and uh that guy had me knocked down mm -hmm. but I was getting back up and they sent us to the drag. And I leaned, my one of my buddies leaned over and said, "You got him now. He don't take good care of his roosters. He said you whoop him in the drag." Mm -hmm. And surely the goodness that came true, his rooster got real weak and couldn't do anything. And 
and it was because of the cure. He, he, he didn't give it to it. Mm -hmm. That that and that is something again that is not popular because it's work, it's labor, it's not glorious. It's not going to get you a bunch of likes and follows and comments and all that kind of stuff on social media. But at the end of the day, the guys at the top of the food chain not only take very care, very good care of their foul, but they deeply understand their foul. Do you, would you agree yeah, with that? I agree, yes. And, and that goes back to a question I was going to ask you. How many lines, how many bloodlines do you think uh, – you should have, you know, or could have to, and be successful? Do you think you need five different bloodlines to be successful? Or do you think the guy that got two or three but deeply understands those two or three uh, have a greater chance than a guy that got five or six and know, you know, 50% about each of those lines? Well, you know, that's that's the question I ask myself quite often. I say <laughs> – and I and you know, I talk to my boy about it. I say we need to cut down. You know, but I mean, I mean, I've been in this, you know, when I'm 60 years old, been in about all my life. Mm -hmm. You know, and I say I can't get rid of my penny hatch. I think they're the best hatch that I got. Mm -hmm. Can't get rid of the blue faces. You know, and the McLeans are very good, and then you know I got the butchers. Definitely wouldn't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. I got the bumblefoot grays, and I got the all grays. You know, I got the uh, regular grays. Uh, my boy's got brown reds. We got some Albany's. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you know, but for somebody that's just starting out, I would say try to get you two or three good bloodlines mm -hmm. and stay with those two or three. Mm -hmm. Because when you get so many, and, you know, as I said, I, I think I'd like to cut down myself. Mm -hmm. But that, that's hard to do for a man being in this business all these years. Mm -hmm. But with two or three, I think you can take better care of them. I think you can uh, breed what you want and how you want and and uh, not be uh, overwhelmed with uh, what am I going to breed if I got 10 bloodlines? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. And you can just concentrate on those three or four or whatever what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think you do very, very uh, good doing that. Right. You know, and um, uh, I just got, uh, you know, probably about 10 bloodlines, but it's uh, all my bloodline is, uh, I can say uh, I'm thankful that it's a, uh, been been proven you know mm -hmm. and it don't don't hurt me to breed you know which uh uh still breed basically you know four or five bloodlines to uh to uh uh do what we got to do more than the others mm -hmm. so and, so uh, once so certain bloodlines you breed a little bit more than others even though you have all of them on a the yard you're not constantly breeding all of them. Is that pretty much correct? Well, it's just like, uh, you know, this year, uh, uh, just say our penny hatch, we got like about six different pens set up of just penny hats to breed, mm -hmm. you know, and then you take the, uh, uh, let's say the, the Albany's, you know, We'd be lucky if we got two pins of them set up to breed, mm. you know. And then the sweaters, you know, that's a <clears throat> that's something that uh that we uh typically breed, you know, quite a few of mm -hmm. uh, because they are uh, what we call a specialist rooster. Okay, and um, they're only bred for one thing. Gotcha. You know, it's it's not like uh, they're breeding a penny or a butcher or something. Then you know they 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 can go several different ways, but the where is only one way, and that's the only reason they are bred. Gotcha. You know. 
so so tell me uh we going we got a few more quick because we already at the two hour mark so i'm i'm, I'm not going to drag it out too much longer but i still do got a few more uh Go questions ahead. yeah a few more questions i know everybody's probably getting exhausted <laughs> but it's been great because hey we've been having 150 160 people on here the whole entire time uh, almost 175 at one time. So, you know, it seems like everybody's still enjoying it. Um, what, what, what I would like to add just, just really quick, and we don't got to get into detail because I know it can be a long, drawn out topic. Uh, but one of, the, one of the individuals in our Telegram group asked uh, as far as, do you like, do you use, back in the day when it was legal, did you use bench work or rotation? I use both. You use both. Okay. And uh, I don't care to tell people that uh, when it's because in my area, it's it's cold, it's cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it's cold, there's a little bit more bench work involved than when it was warm. Got you. When it's warm, you put a rooster in scratch pins, he's going to scratch around and he's going to work his leg muscles. He's going to get mm -hmm. the leg muscles in shape. Mm -hmm. You put him in the fly pen, he's going to hit that roost, keep flying up and flying up, and he's working his wind, building his wind up. So mm -hmm. I didn't think he had to have as much bench work then as he did when it was cold weather, and they just kind of try to stay right. warm. That's right. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Another question that they had, uh, they said to ask you if you had to keep only one bloodline, which bloodline would you keep? That's a no-brainer, I think. <laughs> I keep people, the butchers. You keep it. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely keep it the butchers. Yeah, um, I keep it the butchers. You keep it. Is the butchers what you had the longest? Uh Probably the butchers and the blue blue face hatch, yes. Okay. Those are two you probably had about the longest. Okay. Yeah. Uh back in the day when it was legal, it's another question from the telegram group. Uh is uh do you like a uh, gaff or short knife? Well, I don't um uh, um I like the gaff. You like the gaff? Okay. I enjoy the, I enjoy the short knife. Mm -hmm. And uh if uh if we could show today, that's all my sons would want to show when it would be short night. But I, I kinda like that gag. You like that gag. <laughs> I guess when we was I guess when we was uh uh some traditions are hard to break, I'd say, you know, yeah, and that's that's, right. that's all <laughs> right. I've seen since I was a kid up, you know, so right. Just can't do away with it. Can't do away with it. So is it it's in your it's it's in your roots. That's the core. Yeah. You came into the gap and and, and showed in a gap until it became illegal. Um, yeah. Let me see. So so this is kind of now what we'll, we'll kind of close it out, close the uh, uh, interview out with, and I think it's important. Um, what's some advice that you would give uh, to the new breeders? Something that you wish, if, if and I ain't going to say wish, but some something that you know today that you kind of wish you would have known when you was in your 20s that maybe would have helped you. Well, I first will say that, uh, you know, I kind of uh, had a mentor, you know, being with my dad all, all the time. And uh, uh, everything. But, you know, uh, find you someone that you can trust. Find you someone that will tell you the truth to help you out. Mm -hmm. get you a mentor and watch them and uh, as I say take notes and do as they do mm -hmm. because they're on top of their game for some reason mm -hmm. you know and I mean go to them talk to them if you have to, pick up a feed bucket and feed your chickens for them. Uh, do what you have to so that man will, or hopefully, will help you out 
give you some good advice, maybe even give you a trio of chickens or something like that. But find you a mentor that will help you because he wants to help you. Right. You know, because a lot of people in this sport don't want to tell nobody nothing because they think everything they know is a secret. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and then there's no, I mean, if it's out there, it's, you know, and, and uh, I've read the good book and it says there's nothing new under the sun. Right. You got that so right. It can't be new, you know. So, yeah, I think it's important that, that you find, find you someone that can help you, someone that's been through it and someone that's willing to say, you know, uh, you know, I want to help somebody out in this sport. I want to help somebody to, uh, to, to get better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of times if you got someone like that, a mentor, then, then you, you show your interest and that you want to work hard and, that you want to do good in this sport, uh, most of the time they'll help you out. Right. Right. I agree. I, I agree. Um, and I just wanted you to share that uh, uh, with, with, the, with the, the young cats out there that, that is watching this interview now or later. Uh, but the last thing I would say is with these interviews, like I say, combine over a thousand years of experience with these interviews with all these different breeders. Um, my advice to new breeders is watch all the interviews and not just once, once, but watch them many times, because if you don't have mm -hmm. that local, um, uh, mentor that you can learn from, you can use these interviews as your mentors until you can find a local mentor that you can, you know, work with. But these guys yeah. are coming up here, just like Mr. Mullen. These guys got 30, 40, 50 years of experience and coming on here sharing unfiltered information that some of this stuff you probably would never learn. Some of it you would learn through trial and error. Some of it would take you forever to learn. And you're, you're listening to guys that you know for a fact that has chickens, that raise chickens, that breeds chickens, created their own family of chickens, uh, have competed with all of the interviews that we have done. My opinion, and I'm not just saying this because it's a journey to the pit. These interviews are a hundred or a thousand times more valuable than getting in these social media groups, asking questions to random people, and you don't even know if the person that's commenting even own chickens. One thing you can say, not just me and not because uh, Mr. Mullins is on journey to the pit, but people know Mr. Mullins in real life. And uh, he mentioned some of the people that know him that's been in the game 40, 50 years. You know, these people know him personally. You're listening to somebody that's a real live cocker, a real life breeder, uh, been in the sport a long time. I would say if you cannot, because sometimes mentors are hard to get hold of. And the fact that the matter is, is all of us is, ain't going to be able to find a mentor. It ain't enough of them out there. No, but until... Yeah, until you can find a mentor, listen to these interviews. Let these interviews be your mentor until you can find a local mentor. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. So that's that's the last words I have to say. Uh, any last words or you good, Mr. Mullins? No, just keep them healthy and keep them crawling. And, you know, best of luck to everyone. And thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's been a great, great pleasure. As always, Mr. Mullins and I always talk anyway on the phone outside of this interview, but uh, I greatly appreciate you coming on to the show. I'm pretty sure the viewers greatly appreciate you coming on to the show. It's always a pleasure uh, to listen to another breeder with a whole different background, different part of the country, raising different families to kind of hear their story, their experience, and their history uh, because it brings value to somebody that's going to be watching now and watching later. So until next time, y'all guys out there, stay focused, stay positive, stay blessed. And Mr. Mullins, I'll be talking to you soon. So we will go ahead and we're going to close this show out with that tonight. Y'all have a great evening. And Mr. Mullins, I'll talk to you soon, brother. Have a good night. All right. Good, good night, brother.